We got an elbow. Thanks, Clay. Hey guys, can we give it up for that amazing band though? Let's just be honest. Yeah, Clay, I was 110% one of those people's belting it out, okay? Two rows back, we've got Paris, Marissa, Brianna. They probably heard me belting it out right there. So great to meet y'all. Listen, let me just say this first and foremost. Y'all done brought me out the house, okay? <laughs> Clay called, I was like, I don't know, brother. We in a global pandemic. I just don't know about it. But seriously, I love y'all so much that I clawed my way out of Atlanta, Georgia and came on down to overflow. Baby, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here for it. Seriously, I love what you guys are doing. I love the energy here. It was the perfect excuse to get out of the house. I was like, don't nobody call me, okay? Husband, daughter, I don't know who you are, okay? Um, but man, I'm excited to be with y'all tonight. Um, it's just good, man. When Clay asked me what I wanted to talk about, uh, I knew exactly right off the bat. I've been talking about uh, this topic, this man, since March, since everything went down. Um, and so I'm just excited to bring that here to you guys today. It's what's held me and my family together. It's what's held my ministry together. Um, and I'm just excited to share it with you guys tonight. But listen, as Clay said, this is a space where speakers get to come in and let you guys get to know us, okay? So I'm making it a point that every time I get to come to Overflow, as long as I do well, y'all bring me back, um, I'm gonna tell you guys a story about myself. I'm gonna be as honest as I can, as transparent as I can, and I'm just gonna be real, okay? So let's get that picture up on the screen real quick. All right, this is a picture of a pool. Do I have any swimmers in the building? Have you ever been on a swim team? Where you at? Okay, one right, great. Okay, this whole section over here, perfect. Nobody over here, great. Okay, you right there. Thank you so much for your continued support. And uh, one and a half people over there in the back, great. Um, so listen, when I grew up, I was in all the things, okay? I am a three on the Enneagram. I wanna do everything, okay? I wanna be all things, all men, okay? Um, I was a competitive cheerleader. I <laughs> tried to be on the step team. I was a little uncoordinated, but I was still doing my thing. Failed miserably at volleyball, just so bad. I don't know if I wasn't tall enough or what the problem was. Um, but I was really, really good at cheerleading, and I was really, really good at drama, Obviously, okay. Um, but I said, I want to do something different. So I go to my mom, and I was like, Mom, your girl wants to be on the swim team, okay? This is my moment. I was like, I got the paperwork. They will accept me. I don't actually think there's tryouts. I think you could just be on the team. And my mom was like, no. I said, I want to be on the swim team. I want to do the thing. I think I'm going to crush it, Mom. She said, no. I said, Mom, Why? She said, well, first of all, you can't swim. I said, okay, sis, you're a hater. I didn't say that, but I thought it, okay? <laughs> didn't say it out loud, but I did think it. I said, what are you talking about? She said, no, last summer you jumped in the deep end with the pool noodle, you almost lost your life. I said, I'm past that point, okay? I've done a few things. And she's like, no, 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 I just don't think you should be on the swim team. I'm like, Mom, I'm like throwing one of those like, mom, kind of tantrums. I'm like, I wanna be on the swim team, I can do this. She said, what you gonna do about your hair? I said, what are you talking about? She said, you know, your edge is gonna be looking crazy. <laughs> I said, you know, I just <laughs> need you to believe in me, okay? I will get a swim cap, those things work sometimes. Um, she was like, all right, fine, go do your thing. I was like, okay, bet. I went and got the little black onesie because they don't let you wear a two-piece, and I also went and got like the face goggles because I didn't want to get no water in my nose. I show up to practice for the first day, the swim coach, yep, all the swimmers are laughing, was like, boo, you can't have the one with the nose. I was like, well, how am I gonna swim, sir? I don't under, uh, what are you talking about? He's like, you can't, it's just against the rules, you can hurt your face, you can break some bones. I'm like, this is wild. So I wore the little bitty baby goggles or whatever they're called, and I wasn't doing too well. I'ma just be honest about it. Went to a couple practices, Almost drowned a couple times, um, but I was like in it though. I was like super committed. Then you know, my mama was doubting me, so I was like, I'm gonna prove her wrong. So guys, we get invited to the first little like swim meet. It was like a trial meet or whatever it's called, a thing, I don't know. And my mom's in the crowd, which is a big deal for me at the time. And I'm like, I'm gonna do this thing. My coach gives me the freestyle 100. Hopefully I just said that right, it's four laps. You just go down, you come back up. You go back down, you come back up, you done. I'm like, I'm about to crush it. Y'all, I'm talking mess. Like, I'm, I got a little pride issue already. I'm like, what's up, y'all? I got like my bathing suit on, I don't have a towel on. I'm like walking around, I'm doing my thing. Guys, I get on the little thing. This is how much <laughs> I don't know about swimming. I get on the little pad thing, okay? I got my lane, I'm doing my thing. It's other kids from other schools. I'm like, what's up? They're dead serious. They haven't said anything to me at all. I was like, what school are you from? They were like, 
I was like, okay, little tadpoles, fine. You guys wanna be serious, great. Y'all, I mean, I, I know people are like, this one right here, this lady right here is about to drown. So you guys, I get down to the edge thing or whatever of the little plank thing, whatever it's called. They blow the little whistle, shoot the little baby gun. Guys, I dive in, belly flop, immediately. <laughs> Not, I mean, literally, I say, flat on the water, okay? I was like, whoa, 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 sis, shake it off. Woo, we almost lost it, we almost did. So I just like push my feet, and then I push against the wall, you know? Cause you gotta get a little speed. And I'm going, I'm doing my thing. I'm like, stroke, stroke. As I learned in practice, it's like, breathe, sis. And I'm like, stroke, stroke. And I think I'm really doing good. I'm like, I'm a mermaid, I'm doing my thing. I'm doing my thing. And I get down, you guys. I like look up, and these other kids are serious tadpoles, okay? They are like all the way at the end of the day. I'm like, it's all good, sis. We're doing the best that we can. Guys, I'm swimming. I'm doing my thing. I get down to the end of this little pool stripe thingamajigger. And guys, you have to like flip. And somehow you flip and you land the opposite way. And then you push off of the wall. So I'm like, all right, this is my moment. Stroke, stroke, breathe, stroke, stroke, breathe. Guys, I front flip, and then I stand up, and I'm still facing the wall. And I'm like, okay, this is getting a little wild. I said, it's all good. You're still gonna crush it. You're the little mermaid. Guys, I literally just turn my body around, and then I just like hop and push off the wall again, and I keep going. Y'all, I'm breathing, listen to me, okay. I, I, can't, I will never forget it because I literally almost killed myself. I'm breathing, so I'm swallowing water. I'm taking like breaks. I'm only on my second lap. Like if you've ever really tried to swim fast, it is very tiring. It's like the, like the staircase kind of thing at the gym. Guys, I'm going. I'm on my second lap. I look up for a moment and these other tadpole kids are on their fourth. You hear what I'm saying? They have come back down done another front flip, twisted themselves some way, and they're coming back like facing me. And I literally thought in that moment, I said, I'm a cheat. I am about to cheat. I do not care. I'm gonna die here today or I'm gonna cheat. Guys, they literally catch me up. They're on their fourth lap and I'm just on my second. But I pretend that it is also my fourth because I am not doing another flip, and I am not going back down that water, okay? And I'm literally swimming with them as if I'm still like with them in the race, but they have already won so hard. I get out of the water with them, y'all. Yeah, I did. I'm like, whoop, whoa, that was crazy. I start walking off, legit my coach is like running. Tony, Tony, I'm like, it, it was a great first race, it's crazy, man, it's crazy. I'm literally running out, you guys. I literally make eye contact with my mom who's in the stands and I'm like, let's go, let's go right now. Legit, I quit swim team that day, do you hear me? Now, I gotta work on my mama though cause y'all know she gonna get in the car talking about me. Y'all already know how parents are because they're disrespectful, okay? But we get back in the car, you guys, and I'm gonna be honest, like let's just be real for a moment. I was so embarrassed. Like I legit grabbed all of my stuff out of the locker room and I'm like, mom, like just come and get me, bro. And I get in the car, y'all, and you, <laughs> you know when you're trying to be hard but it's really something wrong, you're like, my mom's like, you okay? I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fine. My mom is like, and then she, she pulls that like little back rub thing, you know? And you're like, oh, God, that's, that's dope. So. And I'm so, y'all, y'all know how it is, man. Like middle school, high school, like it's just your moment, right? Like you don't ever want to trip in front of nobody. You never want to be embarrassed. It's just like so important. It's like world is over. I can never go to school again. It is literally, like literal destruction. But here's what's so crazy, y'all. My mom in that moment, leans over to me and she goes, I know you're hurting right now. I know you're embarrassed, but can I tell you that I'm so happy I got to see you swim? Because years before that, my mom had a massive stroke and we almost lost her. She was paralyzed on the left side of her body. She went through tons and tons of physical therapy and then about a year later, she had three mini strokes um, she lost a lot of oxygen to her brain. She started having seizures. There was never a moment where I thought, my mom is gonna live tomorrow. 
all throughout elementary school and then now all throughout middle school. My mom just couldn't show up for me. And my dad worked all the time. So this was kind of like the first moment that she got to come out with her walker to the swim meet and I straight up embarrassed myself. But it was a super special moment for us because for the first time, my mom was like out, out. Like she was talking to people and she was supporting me and she was trying to cheer me on as best she could. And I had the weirdest feeling that moment. It was like this internal wrestling of like, but I'm embarrassed and I'm not gonna have any friends tomorrow. And man, I'm so glad my mom got to see this. That she got to cheer me on and be here because even if she doesn't make it another week or month or year, like she's here right now. And it was the weirdest feeling. It's like you wanna cry, <laughs> but then you're like, I love you, mom, but also I'm like so mad. But then also I like love you so much. And it's this perfect balance of hurt and hope. And I think today I wanna talk about that because I feel like we're somewhat in the gray of that right now. In our stories, in our world, in our school, it's this like balance of trying to find the hope in all good things, but also being honest about the reality that stuff just sucks. So I wanna start with this question right here. I just wanna ask you today, have you ever felt hurt and hope at the same time? I mean, come on, if I have any uh, sports players in the building, you know, it's like that game where you like missed every shot. You missed every shot, you didn't get a touchdown, you didn't hit nam ball at all, but your team still won, right? So you're like beating yourself up inside, but also you're like, yeah, bro, it was cool, like we won the game, I hate this game. Like, it's just hard, right? You know, or maybe it was a relationship that you knew was just like completely toxic. And you're like, yes, I broke up with her or him. I did it. I have dignity. I'm going to keep my dignity. But also you're balancing the hurt of being alone. Not having anyone to text at night or hit up about your, your coolest moments. Maybe for some of you in this room, it was someone that you lost, who you watched battle for their life. And you're great and glad that they don't have to be in pain anymore but you're hurting because they're gone. Maybe for some of you right now, it was the rando announcement that was made that you know campus is virtual, but then there's like Hunger Games because only one person can be in the dorm and it's just wild out here. And it's like on one end, like, yeah, I don't wanna get COVID from my roommate, but on the other end, it's like, bro, I just got here. Like, I don't know, y'all ruined March through May, but now I'm back again and it's just like this wrestling, it's like, the messy middle of life. And I just don't think we talk about that as much as we need to. At the beginning of COVID, everybody kept asking me, interview after interview, IG Live, oh my gosh, I was so tired of IG Lives, Zoom after Zoom, everyone kept saying, Tony, how do you feel about the global pandemic? And I'm like, freak, I don't know. Because on one end, I'm devastated that all my speaking gigs and all the things that I would go do on the road, I was supposed to take my kid to Africa this summer, like all of these things are gone. But at the same time, I'm so freaking privileged that we can be at home and we have finances to, to get food for my kid and we can buy virtual stuff for virtual school. And I know that there are some people out there who, who just really didn't have a lot and who's really struggling and they have to go to work, but I get to stay home with my kid. Like, I don't know, I'm like in the middle. I'm like grateful, but I don't wanna talk about being grateful because everybody else is hurting. So I'm just like, ah, I don't know, right? Like, I don't know, it's this, this messy middle. And I think what I've personally learned over these these next or these last few months has been this right here that the truth is God meets us there in the middle, right? Like he's not just this God that's waiting at the end of the tunnel, waiting on the other side of the valley as we like claw our way out. No, he's a God that's with us in the middle. And here's the truth, friends, like he's not only with you, right? He's with our whole globe, God's there in the middle for the generations to come and the generations before. I mean, how do I know this? Man, story after story in the Bible teaches us about how God just was in the middle. How he's hope at the end of the tunnel, but he's also the one there carrying the weight of our hurt. 
And there's this one particular story in the Bible that I got to share with y'all because I think it, it's so wild. It's so wild. It, it's such a, a crazy, like, reality TV type story. Like, you would see this on, like, Real Housewives or something like that. But it's Jesus, too. So it's like, okay, this is cool, right? And it's in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And here's what's happening. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Now, a little context, family and friends. <laughs> Jesus is in Jerusalem doing his thing, and he's not the most liked dude in the room. Bro. Like, he's like the one that everybody's talking about. Like, who is this Jesus coming in here, shaking up all our stuff, changing all the rules that we've built over time? We got the law of Moses. I don't know what this brother's up in here doing with his Jesus sandals and his long hair and all his things. And he knows it. Jesus knows that people don't like him very much. And he's been in Jerusalem preaching. And the Pharisees are mad. They're like, bro, you need to go. But you know what's so, so crazy about Jesus is he presses into pain. He's like, nope, I'm going to go in the temple, which is the place where everybody's going to be. And I'm going to keep talking about this because I can. Right? And so the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. Now, let me give you a little context on this. Now, cheating, adultery, is like a, a big old no-no back in the day. Okay? It's still, obviously, it's still now. Okay? We didn't, <laughs> we didn't switch it up on us, but it's like a civil, like, it is like against the law. Mean, it's like murder. Okay? Let me just say it was like, it was a bad, bad, bad thing, okay? Still a bad thing, still a bad thing, but it's a bad, bad, bad thing. The consequences were really, really bad back then. Um, and so, like, this is a big old deal. Like, and then when you really think about it, this is why I love the Bible so much, because you, you really gotta dive into it to understand fully the context, because sometimes we read the Bible as if it were us. Like, oh, dang, she got caught cheating. Like, oh, like, it's kind of funny a little bit. It ain't funny, okay? Because in order to even be caught in adultery, in order to like actually say that someone committed adultery, this is going to be a little weird, but you had to see them in the act. It wasn't enough to like assume to find like a couple texts and emails. Obviously, they didn't have that. But you, they had to see them in the act. Now, in order to see them in the act, it almost had to be like a setup. Like they were watching them. Like, oh, okay. You know, you see, you see John over there, John and uh, Rachel. They've been, uh, they've been getting close. You know he married. I know he married. It's crazy. But they had to literally set it up, watch them, follow them like spies to catch them in the act just so that they could bring them to this specific moment when Jesus was at the temple, not only to embarrass her, but to embarrass Jesus as well. So this is all premeditated. It's a serious offense. This woman could be in prison and lose her life because of this. They have set all this up. All right, <laughs> let's go. All right, they said this to Jesus. Teacher, they're so proud too. This woman was caught in the act of adultery and in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, kill. Now, what do you say? They're like, boom. We did it. They probably feel so good about themselves. We set this woman up. We knew you were going to be here, probably somewhere preaching in the temple. It's about to go. To, it's a movie. That's what they're saying. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Okay, let's keep going. Get excited. This is juicy. The Bible's juicy. All right. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Unbothered is what that is. Jesus is like, so and then he just kind of was drawn on the ground, okay? Okay, then they kept on questioning him. He straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And he was like, boom, he like dropped the mic and he just stood right back down and just started drawing in the sand. All right, here's what happens next. At this those who heard begin to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, 
woman, come on, y'all. Jesus is so slick, right? He's like, woman, where are they? <laughs> Has no one condemned you? Come, y'all, this, this is what I'm saying. When you really start getting in the, you're like, Jesus was a G, okay? Like, you're, imagine like sitting in the corner like, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? Okay. Oh, 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 they leaving. They leaving. Oh, my gosh. Because remember, they were so bold. They had come up with this whole scheme, right? Like, they were like, we about to set it off. And it's like, no, you're embarrassed now. And you're walking away. And then Jesus turns to this woman. Oh, my God. Can y'all imagine the woman? They, she was caught in the act. Bust in on. She's grabbing all her stuff. They're dragging her through the city. Imagine how embarrassed she was. Ashamed she was. Afraid. Hurt. And now everybody's gone. And it's just her and it's Jesus. And this is what happens. And he goes... The lady responds to him after he asked the question, where they at? No one, sir. No one condemned me. And Jesus says to her, then neither do I condemn you. He said, go now and leave your life of sin. Let me just, let me bring this to us today. We've made so many mistakes in our lives. We've gotten caught cheating on tests and everything else. We've gone a little bit too far with that girl or guy. We drank a little too much. We did something we shouldn't have. We got so upset. And we have been in broken places. And typically, when people tell this story in the Bible, they're like, don't you go condemning people. But I just want to take a moment to focus on the woman. Because this woman is completely ashamed, completely hurt. There's no hope. Oh, come on. No hope available for her. Today was the day that she would get stoned publicly at the temple. And the reason why I think John is writing this to us is to show us that even in the messy middles of our lives, even when we are standing there like the woman was, trembling because hope just didn't seem available, God steps into the middle and becomes the very hope you need. Jesus stepped into this woman's story. Who had done wrong? And gives her the only thing that Jesus can give us, hope, salvation, as as our worship leader said, freedom. But the question is, with this proof, this tangible proof, this story thousands of years ago, will we believe him? Will we believe that he is the hope right in the middle of our deepest hurt? And will we accept that there is hope right in the middle of our most deepest pain, that joy is available to us and get comfortable right there in the middle of it all. So what do we do? Here's a couple practical things. Number one, sit in the pain. Oh, no, no, Tony. I wanna just push it over there like it's not happening. Nope, I'm a dude. I'm good, I'm straight. What would it look like if we decided and knew that we lived in a completely broken world, filled with completely broken people, and that there were going to be moments that we were gonna hurt? And we actually accepted it. We actually said, yeah, a global pandemic is gonna happen because someone on the other side of the world is gonna get bitten by a 
freaking diabra, okay, of some sort, okay? And it's gonna spread all over the world and we're gonna be in the middle of a global pandemic, in, a, in the middle of civil unrest, in the middle of political season. Surprise, 2020, okay? What is happening right now? Well, we live in a broken world. Hurt's gonna come, pain's gonna come, brokenness is gonna come. So what if we decided to just sit in the pain? Not play victim, but accept it. Here's what Brene Brown says. I love this so much. This is so challenging to us. When you numb your pain, you also numb your joy. Did you know that your brain is wired in a way that the same uh, neurons that your negative emotions come through and flow out of have the same exact pathway as your positive emotions? That if you decided that, nope, I'm not gonna feel that, you actually shunt your ability to feel the positive emotions. That when we say, nope, I don't wanna be in pain, I don't wanna cry, I'm just gonna act like nothing's happening, we also start to damage our ability to experience the greatest amounts of joy in our lives. So what's something that you're going through right now that you've just been pushing back there? What's something that you can maybe take a step back in and invite some joy into, invite Jesus into, invite God to come and, and, and do something with you in the middle of your pain? What conversations can you have? Who can you trust to say, hey, I'm going through this. I'm feeling all of this right now. And it hurts and it sucks real bad. Can we invite that in? And can we invite God into that, into the mess? I don't know about you. I'm a, again, I'm a three on the Enneagram. I like to achieve. And so naturally, I think that God loves me more when I'm doing great. So I go to him in like all the great times. I'm like, bro, did you hear that message I preached though? You know, like, right? Like, did you, did you see I spent a whole lot of quiet time? Did you see that? Like, I go to him with all the good things, but I get so nervous and so ashamed to go to him with the pain, with the hurt. I get ashamed to go to my friends. I'm the strong one of the crew, of the group. I can't. But gosh, when we start to release and accept how we're battling and struggling and the things that hurt us, we get to open up our minds, our spirits, our hearts to the hopeful things too. Here's a question I wanna challenge you on. Will you let God in the middle? Will you let him in the middle of your pain? Will you let him step into the tunnel with you, into the valleys with you, and sit there and rub your back and listen to you and be there for you? Will you stop hiding that you really are hurting? And will you allow God to come in that space so that you can begin to understand that there's hope available too? The song that we sang earlier, which is crazy, we didn't even coordinate this. God of revival. I literally put this in my slides before I even got here. The slides right now, the God of revival. God, we got it, we're doing great. God is the revival in the crushing. God has been hardwired. He has decided to be exactly in everything who we need him to be. God is the revival in the crushing, right in the middle if we just let him in there, if we just let him come and be everything to us. Quick story and then I'm gonna let you guys go. I was driving down the road with my daughter and she is just like me. So she loud and she dramatic, okay? Just gonna be real. We're driving on the highway and she's like, oh, mom. And I'm like, are you okay? Did you drop that oatmeal? I told you not to eat that in the car. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, mom, look. I'm like, what? She's like, look. And I look up in the sky and I see this. <laughs> She's like, it's the moon. <laughs> I was like, it is the moon, sis. Uh, wow, you gotta be into it though. Whoa, the moon, whoa. And she was like, do you know what that means? I'm like, no, tell me, girl. 
She's like, it's the moon and it's the morning time, mom. And I'm like, yeah. So crazy, girl. I literally have no idea what she's talking about. She's like, do you know what that means, mom? I said, what? She said, it means that God created the darkness and the light. Because the sun is right there. And the moon is right there too. And I couldn't even believe it. God is showing us right here through his creation that he knows darkness. But dang it, he knows light too. He's all things, all knowing. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows that heartbreak that you're experiencing and he knows the victory of your celebration and your hope. God knows your loss and he knows your gain. He knows the lonely, dark places. But he knows that moment where you realize your worth for the first time. God knows pain and he knows purpose. He knows darkness and he knows light. And he understands that we are complex human beings with emotions, with hurt, and with hope. And we're just, just trying to figure out the middle. Just trying to figure out how we can exist carrying both in our hands. And saying, yeah, I'm broken and I got some stuff and this world is broken and, and school sucks right now. We don't know what's going on. But hope is available to me too. Friends, when you're in your darkest moments of pain, please, I hope you never forget. Hope you never, ever forget that there's hope available for you too. And God is there with you. And he can carry you to hope when you can't carry yourself. If I were to sum this entire thing up into to one sentence that hopefully you just walk away with and you start to maybe put an armor of this onto your spiritual being and your mental being as you walk back into emails and texts and calls trying to figure out what the next three months looks like for you, I hope you would remember that hurt and hope can coexist. That you can stand right there in the middle and God's gonna stand there with you too. I hope you know that. I hope you believe it with every fiber of your being. I hope you know that in this complex, messy, crazy world, there's a God that wants to revive you, bring you out of the darkest pain into the greatest joys. There's a God that knows that hurt and hope can coexist and he wants to help you process through it. So we're gonna sing this last song and I just think you're gonna love it so much. I think it describes this, this messy middle place and hopefully through these lyrics, you would just begin to understand it, to maybe believe it a little bit more. And maybe for some of you in the room, you wouldn't invite God into it, into this weird, gray, complex, messy, middle place. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much, first and foremost, for giving us life right now. God, we have seen hundreds and thousands of people lose their lives this year so quickly so suddenly, families have lost their loved ones and they're hurting. And so in this moment, we thank you that we even have breath in our lungs. And then God, we also thank you that while we are here on this earth, breathing and talking and walking, that we would remember you and what you did for us. That we would remember the moment you looked a woman in the eye and said, I don't condemn you. I love you. Go 
and live a life free of sin. Jesus was with her thousands of years ago and he is with us right now, right now in the middle, right now in between hurt and hope. However close hope is and however much hurt we're processing through, Jesus is right there in the middle, seeing us through. We love you, God. Give us the courage to just love you right back. That's in your son Jesus' name. Amen.